Hi, I'm Brad Bateman, the president of Randolph College. Welcome to our annual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Never before in my lifetime has the importance of Dr. King's legacy been more clear. If I may give just one example, there is a well-funded, well-organized political movement afoot in this country today whose primary aim is to deny black and African American citizens political power. Through gerrymandering and voter suppression laws, they seek to diminish the voting rights of our black and African American brothers and sisters. We cannot pretend that Dr. King's legacy is not important today. We cannot pretend that he ultimately won the fight. The fight goes on. And now I'm pleased to introduce to you the president of our student government, J. Lynn Evans, who will read to us from Dr. King's words. I'd like to open this event by sharing a quote from Martin Luther King Jr.'s The Role of the Church in Facing the Nation's Chief Moral Dilemma. But the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. The type of love that I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. I encourage you all to listen to the speakers today and take their messages to heart as we strive towards making the beloved community a reality here at Randolph College for people of every background to thrive. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Wall Rice, who is a professor of psychology at Morehouse College and a principal investigator of the Identity, Art, and Democracy Lab, a research space that looks at expressions of identity, balanced through engagement, the exploration of varied context, and personal narratives. Dr. Rice's work is focused on how people adapt to a variety of contexts, and more specifically in popular culture. We are grateful to Dr. Rice for taking the time to speak with us and share how he understands and honors Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. Hello, and thank you so very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak on the occasion of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday recognition here at Randolph College. In these especially strained times of distancing and of taking good care of one another, I'm even more appreciative for the opportunity to share ideas and for those who invest time in considering them. And for making a space to do that, I am particularly grateful for President Bradley W. Bateman, Steve Willis in the President's Office, Keeley Tuggle in Special Events, and Keisha Burke Henderson, your Chief Diversity Officer and Director of the Office of Identity, Culture, and Inclusion. And I'm always grateful for the student scholars, and there's no hyperbole here, the future of the nation and of the world. My lecture today is entitled Radical Grace in the Freedom Work of Now. So as we begin, what of context? Dr. King queries with chapter one of his text, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Where are we? This is a penetrating question of space and time that's important to consider because it offers us guidelines by which to do the work and to figure exactly what work there is to be done. It is the framework within which we are painting our masterpiece of being original. Of course, we're quite literally at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. It is popularly said, socioculturally, that we're in the midst of racial reckoning. But who is we? Black people and otherwise marginalized persons in the United States of America have been reckoning with race since the genocide of Native peoples in this country and the enslavement of black folk. The we, then, is now supposedly more widely inclusive of white folks. I use the qualifier more widely because it is known that some white people have always been about that life of liberation. But generally, now, white people are reckoning with race, racism, 
in the psycho-spiritual reality of living in and thriving from a legacy that built a nation on the backs of unpaid, inhumane labor that translates into a now that puts people who look and or who act different than stereotypical whiteness at the bottom of a hierarchical capitalistic totem. And there's an audacity to widely practice cultural whiteness. This is the case just by default of what white supremacist systems portend. Here, here's a note. I was originally going to decline the invitation to speak here at Randolph. The college has no full-time black professors. It is located in Lynchburg, Virginia, and those two things alone equal no for me. I mean, no black profs in the city where the college is located is named for the brother of the judge who employed no due process laws that evolved into the mob murder of black people. And then Aubrey Shuey, an exponent of scientific racism, was once chair of your psychology department. Yeah, I was I was good. As kind uh, as the correspondence was in inviting me to talk, I was going to be equally as kind in my refusal. But in talking with President Bateman, he shared that I was asked to speak upon the recommendation of Keisha Burke Henderson, and I said yes immediately, in my mind at least, because I trust her, and I trust the justice, education, diversity, inclusion planning that she has done for going on two decades now. Straight talk, I want to be a Jedi just like her when I grow up. Get it? If not, just run the video back and it'll come to you. And because this colleague of mine didn't flag me to let me know that the call from Randolph was coming, I knew she knew and understood the tightrope that I would be considering with the invitation. Having someone with this level of cultural literacy and ability to negotiate nuance is key within white systems that are committed to change because they build necessary bridges that allow for growth. Even though I felt away in seeing my name and face in the Lynchburg Reporter, I'm happy to be a part of Randolph College's community today. This is the context within which I understand us as being and the work ahead of us. It is freedom work, but freedom work for white people necessarily requires not only uncomfortable contextualization that is bound in historical fact like, like what I just offered, but also in difficult questions and in honest answers. Again, Dr. King helps us with, quote, why is equality so assiduously avoided? Why does white America delude itself and how does it rationalize the evil it retains? The majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. Overwhelmingly, America is still struggling with irresolution and contradictions. It has been sincere and even ardent in welcoming some change, but too quickly apathy and disinterest rise to the surface when the next logical steps are to be taken. Laws are passed in a crisis mood after a, a Birmingham or a Selma, but no substantial fervor survives the formal signing of legislation the recording of the law in itself is treated as the reality of reform. This limited degree of concern is a reflection of an inner conflict which measures cautiously the impact of any change on the status quo. As a nation passes from opposing extremist behavior to the deeper and more pervasive elements of equality, white America reaffirms its bonds to the status quo." End quote. Dr. King offered this writing 55 years ago. The prescient nature of his analysis is why it's important to engage not just once a year at the celebration of his birthday, but continuously in dealing with moral laws and the importance of internal change. I argue that the status quo for white people is becoming untenable because of the reality of non-white lived experiences that exist beyond whiteness and that threaten it. 
your governors just signed law banning a phantom critical race theory curriculum in K through 12 public education in Virginia, the 2021 January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, and voter suppression laws where at least 33 states have introduced pre-filed or carried over 165 bills to restrict voting access are examples. And what I mean is the privilege of being white and existing in this reality of privilege to the exclusion of other cultures and realities is, is crumbling. This is happening because white people are beginning to understand their interconnectedness with others and how white systems of normalcy have and are hurting or even killing others. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and on. But even as some realize this, others are quite simply in denial. The original sin of racism and persistent interlocking racist hurt and harm is difficult to make real in the conscious mind because certainly understanding someone as better or worse dependent on their skin does not make sense. So how then is it real that there has been a group of people who built and who now benefit from elegant and elaborate structures, economic, religious, academic, legal, cultural, and other, that privilege them because of their having white skin. I imagine it is a scary thought at worst, uncomfortable at best. But this is what was said in the summer of 2020, where there was the rebirth of white racial reckoning. Embrace the discomfort, sit with it, so that change can come. There were public displays of solidarity and of inclusivity that extended from corporations through sports teams to yard signs. But as Dr. King outlines too quickly, apathy and disinterest rise to the surface when the next logical steps are to be taken. Where there was the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it was gutted in 2013 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021, H.R. 4, is legislation that is now stymied in partisan politics, politics that reflect the fears of white folk being honest about what true American democracy looks like. This is the psychological tension at play that is at center for white people who want to be the necessary moral change required for the idealized American democracy that we say we value. But there remains the discomfort or the fear that the status quo will be replaced by a new norm that is defined by karma, responsive to and demanding accountability for the inhuman and hateful action given to people of color in this country since its beginning. We are parallel to the waning tide of South African apartheid in this regard. We know that we've done wrong, but truth and reconciliation seems too heavy a burden. Nonetheless, it is one that must be realized. Because in order to realize radical grace for the ills done to others and to oneself, in order for there to be internal absolution, the most important type, there has to be honesty and the recognition of wrongdoing and of misalignment to, just, to justice. This is significant psychological work that white people have to do. There's pop talk of being anti-racist that Ibram X. Kendi talks of, and this is important. But before you can be anti-racist and can engage in racial reckoning out there, there is the self that has to be situated and tended to. Randolph College the academic and administrative community, and most importantly, the student scholars have the obligation to be better than having no full-time black professors. They have an obligation to right set the educational environment for its students, for those 60% who are white and for the 40% of color. This is so very important because this liberal arts education environment is growing leadership in a future that the world needs. Your original perspective is only as good as the truth that, is it, that it is based in. Stepping back a bit, to be clear, I am a personality psychologist who looks at the self and identity. 
I don't want you to paint me outside of my lane with uh, my talk of grace and absolution. But I know that the college's United Methodist underpinnings will allow me a little bit of latitude. One of my psychology professor, professors, the esteemed W. Curtis Banks, wrote the following. One of the most enduring legacies of any society is its structure of myths. These myths, usually romanticized through simplification and exaggeration, key dimensions of historical experience, along with the principles, values, and moral implications that derive from them. Powerful myths, he said, have remarkable endurance, evolving in narrative form, along with society's technical changes, while retaining the original substance of their central lessons. Now, I can take this quote in any number of directions, but I'll land it here. There is the myth, the misunderstanding, that we are different, you and I, based on my being black and your being white or another race, let's say. But this is a biological fiction. There is a cultural historical dynamic to race and a psychobiological reality, to be sure. But there is no biological difference between the races. This is helpful to remember inasmuch as we can understand ourselves as being more the same than different. This pulls black people and other people of color out of the space of object allowing for there to be more authentic engagement and the reduction of operating from stereotypes and truncated schemas. Truth in what humanity looks like allows for white people to recognize that people of color are deserving of human treatment, true. But more crucial to see is that as a white person, when you are treating a person of color outside of humane practice, you are dehumanizing yourself more so than the other that you engage as being less than. This was a central lesson that Martin Luther King Jr. dramatized in his nonviolent movement. This truth at once simplifies the human experience and hopefully complicates racism into oblivion with the understanding that our freedoms are inextricably bound. We cannot walk alone. This is paraphrasing uh, of King's spin on political freedom, but I also think it's searingly salient to our psychological freedom. If you cannot engage me, a black man, as equal, I might be denied practical freedoms, but you are denied psychological freedoms with consequences that are arguab arguably more deleterious. Employing King's prescient prose once more, here at the 1967 American Psychological Association Convention, he says, quote, the present crisis arises because although it is historically imperative that our society take the next steps to equality, we find ourselves psychologically and socially imprisoned. We move beyond this narrowing, I argue, by deconstructing and refusing to abide by myths about the human condition, by utilizing education as a birth of democratic space that can engender change, by exercising our agency in working toward equality and through the assumption of accountability. Radical grace is revealed with a freedom work of now that is anchored in radical honesty about the self and its connect to the social contracts that we engage in with one another. It is deep and sincere psychological work that has the ability to change selves in ways that can shift social paradigms for the greater good. This can sound grand and unattainable, but certainly so too did the possibility of freedom to those who were enslaved, who were denied the right to fully participate in American democracy because of Jim Crow, and American apartheid. But here we are, all the products of our ancestors' wildest dreams. And, and how do we do better? There is no doubt that you are familiar with the truism that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. What I have shared here is that the belief that the marginalized are the oppressed is only half true. Those who engage in the sin of oppression 
both directly and indirectly through whatever ignorance delusion of self or blind attachment to myths are also oppressed but there is forgiveness grace and arteries to freedom where there is a surrender to truth and that freedom allows us to engage the world critically and creatively to live and work honorably and to experience life abundantly toward the idealized democracy that is the great experiment of america about forgiveness a preamble to grace king asserts let us be practical and ask the question how do we love our enemies first we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive he who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love it is impossible even to begin the act of loving one's enemies without the prior acceptance of the necessity over and over again of forgiving those who inflict evil and injury upon us it is also necessary to realize that the forgiving act must always be initiated by the person who has been wronged the victim of some great hurt the recipient of some torturous injustice the absorber of some terrible act of oppression the wrongdoer may request forgiveness he may come to himself and like the prodigal son move up some dusty road his heart palpitating with the desire for forgiveness but only the injured neighbor the loving father back home can really pour out the warm waters of forgiveness forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act it means rather that the evil act no longer remains as a barrier to the relationship forgiveness is a catalyst creating the atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning is it possible that in this twisted scheme of racism that the would-be enemy is sometimes one's self the answer is yes so then understand that forgiveness a pivotal step toward grace and freedom is a self-act forgiving one's self in shakespeare's play hamlet polonius instructs his son laertes in leaving for university this above all else to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man be true forgive yourself find grace be free and make life better for those who follow that is the freedom work of now thank you so much Thank you, Dr. David Wall Rice, for your message today. We are honored to have heard from you and hold tight the message of radical grace. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated, I refuse to accept despair as the final response to the ambiguities of history. I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature makes him morally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts him. Based on the principles of the six steps of nonviolent social change, we wanted to highlight members of our own community as well as some of the projects that have been taking place. The six steps of nonviolent social change are as follows, information gathering, education, person, personal commitment, negotiation, direct action, and reconciliation. With those things in mind, I wanted to mention a few of our students, as well as, as I said, a couple of projects that we saw as exemplars in our community. Tommy McGinnis, Josh Bolavko, Ninfa Amador, Hernandez, Angelica Rodriguez, Kikeyu Lau. Um, Josh Bolavko and Tommy McGinnis really was integral in our land acknowledgement project. Ninfa Amador Hernandez continues to be a fighter for immigration rights and undocumented students. Angelica Rodriguez gives voice to voiceless, those who uh, may not speak up, she speaks up. Kay Yulao 
who has really shown that she's a leader in many respects, but most of all spoke up during the times when the Asian community was experiencing violence and thought that it was really important that our com community come together. Our SGA president, um, Jalen, we really appreciate all of the work that you do and Jacqueline, our BSA president. So we have a community of students that are really hard at work and we surely appreciate you and all of the students that continue to serve, that continue to put themselves on the line, even when you may not be recognized, we recognize you and we thank you for all of your work. We also thank you for the great work that the professors are doing in the classroom to really show the students what it is that they are capable of and to continue to speak to them in ways that give them the tools that they need and the skills that they need to really put their ideas together and make that personal commitment and getting out there and knowing that they are responsible for the way the, the world is about us. So I would like to close with um, what Dr. Martin Luther King means to me a little. So Brother Martin's life and murder represents, rep represents so many things, but most of all, it is a guidepost of the work that is continuous. Some will say that he symbolizes an end of an era, the birth of civil rights for people of color and black people in particular. However, Martin himself said, and I feel that we must always work with an effective, powerful weapon and method that brings about tangible results, condemning the contingent intolerable conditions that exist in our society. That is excerpted from one of my favorite talks that he gave, The Other America. I encourage all of you to read it when you get an opportunity. So where do we go from here? What will you do this year that will make the next MLK remembrance meaningful in honoring his life? How do we live beyond the quotes? Thank you so much for joining us for this MLK celebration. We ask that you continue to do the relentless work as we continue to extend radical grace. Thank you.